This video card has 24 gigabytes of GDDR5, nearly 5,000 CUDA cores, and you can buy one right now for only $180. Unfortunately, that might be where the good news ends. Today's video is brought to you by Nord Pass's So Long Summer Sale, where you can save 74% on a two-year subscription, plus get an additional four months on the house. NordPass makes managing your online passwords a breeze with their user-friendly desktop and mobile applications, allowing you to store all of your passwords in one location and access them from any device. And thanks to NordPass's zero-knowledge architecture, your passwords are encrypted on your own device before they ever reach their servers. Visit nordpass.com craft and take control of your password management. That's nordpass.com craft. Welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff. This is a card I've been wanting to test out for quite some time, as the specs are absolutely bonkers, especially given its age. The NVIDIA Tesla K80 was introduced in November of 2014 as a data center compute GPU. It's a dual GPU card featuring a pair of GK210-based second-generation Kepler cores, the only card ever to feature these particular GPUs. They each sport 2,496 CUDA cores with a base clock of 562 MHz, a boost of 824, along with 12 GB of GDDR5 memory clocked at 2500 MHz. The K80 has support for all modern graphics APIs, such as DirectX 12, Vulkan, and OpenGL 4.6, meaning that despite being 7 years old, it should still be capable of running modern gaming titles. But, just like all Tesla GPUs, this one comes with a pretty serious Achilles heel in terms of running any games. There are no graphical outputs on this card. It's intended for use only as a compute GPU, plugging away at scientific equations, genome breakdowns, and financial data somewhere up in the cloud. But at its heart, I'm sure there lies the soul of a gaming beast, just waiting to sink its teeth into the frames of your favorite games. Let's get a couple questions out of the way first. No, you cannot make both GPUs on the card run at the same time in SLI. For one, SLI is dead. Second, they are not linked via an SLI bridge or NVLink connector. And third, SLI is dead, just in case you didn't hear me the first time. No, the Tesla K80 will not work as a vGPU card like the cards from my cloud gaming server. The vGPU unlock script works by tricking the OS into thinking your GeForce or Quadra card is a Tesla variant, which has vGPU enabled. Unfortunately, this only works if you have a GPU with the same architecture as a vGPU enabled Tesla card. The Tesla K80 is running on the Kepler 2.0 architecture, which never received compatible vGPU profiles. The Grid K1 and K2 cards were running Kepler 1.0, and the next release were from the Maxwell series. And finally, no, you can't hook up a monitor and play directly on this card. Playing games on this GPU is not perfect and will require some trial and error, and it's definitely not a replacement for a modern GPU. But if it's better than integrated graphics, it might just be worth the headache. Starting off, how do I intend to play games using the power of one of these Tesla cards? This is actually the easy part of the video, as Windows has most of the features we need already set up for us. We just need to tell Windows to let us use them. If you've ever purchased a laptop with both onboard and discrete graphics, you'll already know the trick that we're going to use. GPU switching was a technology developed by Intel and NVIDIA known as Optimus, and allowed for Windows to dynamically shift workload between low-power integrated GPUs and high-power discrete GPUs. Over the years, Microsoft developed their own version natively inside of Windows, but it runs on essentially the same principles. The only problem is, both NVIDIA Optimus and Windows don't allow you to use headless GPUs to render on-screen graphics. Let's change that. For this project, Isaiso sent me over the Tesla K80 in this video, which paired perfectly with the one that I bought just a couple of weeks prior. I'm going to be doing all the testing on an AMD Epic 7601, and I'll explain why at the end of this video. You'll also need integrated graphics on your PC for this to work properly, as just slapping an ATI X1300 or GT710 won't enable the menu that we need. I'm running the latest Insider Preview of Windows 11 for this demo, but much of the tech that I'll be showing off has been around since the 1903 update of Windows 10. To start off, I'm going to install the latest drivers from NVIDIA's website for the Tesla K80. And as this is a Kepler-based GPU, this will be one of the final driver updates ever available for this card. Once the driver is installed, we'll need to tell Windows the K80 is available for high-performance GPU rendering. Inside the Windows registry, there's an entry for each GPU on the Tesla K80. We're going to delete the adapter type flag and add in a new DWORD value called Enable MS Hybrid. Give it a value of 1 to enable the setting, and then reboot your PC. 
After you've booted back up into Windows, you'll want to go to Display Settings and find the Graphics menu. This is where you set your GPU preference for each application. Which brings us to downside number one. You're going to need to specify each and every application you'd like the Tesla K80 to handle rendering on. By default, the PC will still likely use your onboard graphics adapter. With the K80 selected for high performance graphics, go ahead and launch your game. Which brings us nicely into problem number two. Full screen applications seem to be broken. Running in windowed mode will let you run your games just fine. Fine being a relative term, which we'll discuss momentarily. But opening games in full screen tends to render only on your integrated GPU. There's a handy little app I've used to combat this in the past called, wait for it, Borderless Windowed Gaming. Any windowed game can be made to run on a borderless window, whether the option is included in the game settings or not. Launching Unigine Heaven at 1080p, high settings, and normal tessellation, performance is not great. In fact, it's pretty awful, all things considered. You see, while the Tesla K80 may have 2,496 CUDA cores, nearly a thousand more than the GTX 680 or Quadro K5000, they are limited to just 562 megahertz, and GPU boost is disabled by default on most of these cards. Compare those clocks to the GTX 680, which was pushing the 1 GHz mark in its day, and you can see why the Tesla is struggling. Trying to play GTA 5 was even worse, with frame rates down into the high teens on average, and that's at the lowest settings I could set the graphics to. The game is absolutely not playable, but I can't help but feel there's more performance to be had here. Looking at HW Info, while the K80 was locked at 562 MHz, it wasn't being held back by temperature or power limits, meaning there's still some meat on these bones. And luckily, there is an old tool for upping the performance on Kepler-based GPUs. Back before Nvidia started encrypting GPU firmware, there were editors available to tweak nearly every setting inside the cards. Base clock, boost frequencies, power behavior, and per-step voltage control. So while you can't just fire up MSI Afterburner and overclock the K80, you can modify the BIOS to bump up the clocks. The Tesla K80 is advertised as having a boost clock of 824 MHz, nearly 60% higher than the 562 MHz clock it's been running at. Memory on similar Kepler GPUs also ran closer to 2750 MHz, and that's what I dialed up here. So, do these hefty overclocks translate into a playable game experience? Well, yes, but also no. Checking out the performance increase in Unigine Heaven, our benchmark score went from 1187 to 1721 for a 45% performance uplift. Average frame rates were also up from 47 to 68 FPS, a significant improvement just by bumping up the GPU clocks a bit. GTA 5 was still not a great experience, but at least was somewhat playable. The game hovered right around 60 FPS the entire time, with lows never dropping below 35. That's a spectacular improvement over the stock frequencies. The GPUs ran at a crisp cool 45 degrees Celsius while under full load, although that might have something to do with the 15,000 RPM fan that I had blasting air through them. Which brings me to downside number three. Not only did I have to 3D print a fan adapter, these blower fans don't have a setting between 15,000 RPM and zero RPM. So you're not gonna wanna sit in the same room as this card, even with a good set of noise canceling headphones on. Now I've ran some other solutions on passive cards before, like a pair of 40 millimeter blower fans. However, they still didn't do a great job at keeping the GPU cool. This does a phenomenal job, but at the expense of your eardrums. And I know the question that's been on all your minds, is it possible to run the K80 in GPU para virtualization with Hyper-V? While I was able to get the card to show up as a partitionable GPU and successfully get the drivers running, unfortunately, I have not been able to get into a game. The problem is the way Hyper-V handles GPUs with no physical output. While I've successfully partitioned many other cards, like the GTX 1070 and the RTX 3070, so far with compute cards, all I can manage to get is a black screen. Parsec is also unable to render a screen image. However, there is a little glimmer of hope out there. You see, out there in the ether, there are people just as crazy as me, and I happened to stumble across one of them trying out GPU compute cards with GPU para-virtualization configurations. While James did confirm in his blog post that the driver does work, and no display output is available in the setup, the Windows Insider preview builds are allowing GPU acceleration in Hyper-V from compute-only cards. The only problem is seeing that output. An enhanced Hyper-V session or running a GPU accelerated RDP client will at least get you into the desktop, but low latency frames are still pretty hard to come by. There is a piece of software out there that he tried that does have potential called Space Desk. While it's primarily intended for use as a monitor wall app, it supports full resolution, low latency display to a client computer, as well as full mouse and keyboard support. 
Downsides, there is no GPU accelerated encoding support, it is LAN only, and it eats bandwidth for breakfast. A 1440p stream wound up needing around 450 megabit per second. Also, did I mention there's no audio support? Now, they are planning on supporting hardware acceleration and audio in a future release, as well as possible USB device pass-through for game controllers and the like. So this is definitely a project I'm going to be keeping an eye on as a possible cloud gaming client. But for now, there doesn't seem to be anything that will work with a headless GPU solution through Hyper-V. So that's it. That's the Tesla K80. It is definitely an interesting card with its 2500 CUDA cores and 12 gigabytes of GPU memory, but I can't help but feel like it's being held back, like there should be more performance available. But if there is any more horsepower left under the hood, I couldn't find it. In practice, the Tesla K80 scored right around on par with the Quadro K5000 at stock speeds and around 40% faster when overclocked. But you need to take the good with the bad, as you will need a motherboard and CPU with integrated video, you'll need to configure every game to use the K80 for high performance graphics, and be willing to troubleshoot and tinker when things don't work properly, because things are not going to work properly. And that's not even my favorite part. Some other boards may not be even able to use the Tesla K80. With 24 gigabytes of video memory, some boards and chipsets literally don't have enough address space, causing the card to wind up with a code 12 when booted inside of Windows. And there's no software fix for that. My original plan was to run the Tesla K80 on an ASRock Z390 motherboard with a 9900K, but none of the PCI Express slots had enough free resources to boot both GPUs on it, which is why I did my testing today on a server platform. As it sits right now, the Tesla K80 is just not a great option as a primary video card, given the hoops that you need to jump through just to get it working. However, if this card could ever be partitioned with GPU-P, I could see it taking a spot in one of my servers, working as a cloud gaming host for my kids' friends who might not have gaming PCs at home. With 2500 CUDA cores and 12 gigabytes of video memory per GPU, there is more than enough horsepower available to run multiple instances of some basic games and stream them to an iPad or Raspberry Pi. Hopefully, as Windows 11 and GPU-P becomes more mature, that whole process will come to fruition. If you are interested in picking up a Tesla K80 for yourself, I will have eBay affiliate links down in the video description where you can snag one for just $180. On your way down there, make sure to drop this video a like and subscribe to Craft Computing if you haven't done so already. Follow me on Twitter at Craft Computing for daily shenanigans like this. And if you like the content you see on this channel and want to help support me in what I do, consider joining the Patreon. Link is also down in the video description. As a bonus, you'll get exclusive access to my Discord server, where you can chat with myself and the other hosts from Talking Heads. Thank you all so much for watching this one, and as always, I will see you in the next video. Cheers, guys. Today's beer is from Forland Beer. It is the Glass Volcano Black Lager, a German-style Schwartz beer clocking in at 5% from McMinnville, Oregon. Very malty. Wow, like oatmeal malt. Ooh, yes. Oh. Are we sure this is only a Schwartz beer and not a stout? Holy crap, that's good. Appearance, robust, aphotic, and black, and character is coffee, malt, and cocoa. Holy crap. That is delicious. Seriously, if you told me this was a 9% stout, I'd have believed you. I love it when I am so surprised by beers that I try on this channel. Uh, I mean, I've had plenty of Schwartz beers, German-style black lagers before, and... They're always pretty good. I mean, they're they're much more malty, but still kind of light-bodied and, and flavorful. And definitely a step up from a traditional lager that we get here in the States. This one is something else entirely, though. This one is rich, malty, this dark coffee roast to it. Um, I'm not tasting much cocoa, but I'm going to give them a pass on this one because, holy crap, this is still delicious. I think that might be the most holy craps in a beer review I've ever done.